Now, we're, we're very fortunate because we have a, a classifier with us who joined us to talk about pairing or answer our questions. So let's just kick it right over or open up to Daniel Shake, the classifier to the stars. Um, and he was going to give us a little bit of, uh, of point of view on, on pairings from a classifier, from a scientist point of view. Daniel? Hey, Topher. Can everyone see me and hear me? Hey, you look good, man. Yeah, let me highlight okay. you. Guys. Okay, sounds good. So I'm going to come at this from a different point of view from some other classifiers, if that makes sense. You, you might have, wait, can everyone see my screen, first of all? Yep. Okay. So you might have heard of the saying lumpers and splitters. Well, it's a, in geology, one of the things we learned when doing uh, any of our field methods courses where they took us out to this large outcrop and we had to essentially do, stratify the layers and say, this layer is made up of shale, this layer is made up of limestone, this layer is made up of sandstone. My instructor put it in a very clean way that everyone had their own sort of ideas and nobody had the perfect stratigraphy column. And the reason for that is because each of us can be sort of partitioned as either lumpers or splitters. Whereas if you're a lumper, you see this one layer, it's made up of, you know, 70% shale and you say, okay, it's shale. And you disregard the 30% being something else. You say the whole thing is one thing. But then you have people who are splitters where they take that one layer of 70% shale and they split that up to three other layers saying this part's shale, this is one layer of sandstone, and this 2% little layer right here is one layer of limestone. So you have two extremes and you have some people in the middle. So I found out very early when I started classifying samples that I'm more of a splitter than as a lumper yeah. as some of other <laughs> classifiers are. Maybe, maybe to a fault, but I have some good reasons for it, which I'll explain here. So let's start with case one. This is Northwest Africa 15500. Now, uh, for anyone who is curious about this, this is the first reported sample of having pink spinel and orthocyte clasts in it. You can tell by, let me put this pointer right here. You can tell by these uh, sort of pinkish clasts right here. These are mostly made up of the minerals anorthite and spinel, which you commonly don't really see them together especially with in these sorts of lunar rocks. So this is sort of a pretty important rock. And if we look back from that, we'll actually see that the rock itself has two lithologies. It's a dimict lunar breccia, if you want to call it that way. But yet one lithology has these pink spinel orthocyte clasts in it. So it's sort of got its own story to it. And part of the research I did on this involved making many pieces of this rock. So one of the pieces, I was curious about the two lithologies. So I separated them in half and I said, okay, this one piece has lith A and lith B. I wanna know how they're related. And then I took two other pieces and I said, okay, now I wanna know about these clasts. So this piece right here, 1625-3 and 1625-4, those are individual pink spinonorthocyte clasts that were taken from lithology A. Hmm. Now here's where the interesting part comes in. So let's say I did research on this, you know, this uh, material right here. Or actually, let's say the research on this specific sample, 1625-2. You might be wondering, why am I labeling each of these separately? And the reason is, if I did research on lithology A and B, and I said, this rock has two lithologies, this is the sample, this is the thin section I used to identify it, and another institution says, okay, we want to do our own research on that sample to look at both lithologies, well, what would happen if I sent them this piece, this piece instead? They'd see the pink spin on orthocyte class, but they'd only get lithology A. They wouldn't get lithology B. So if they were doing trace elements, isotopes, whatever, and they thought that they were getting both lithologies or sampling it, they would be misrepresenting what they're actually looking at. And that can be a problem when you, for example, you expect to have a certain sample and someone says this sample is paired to that sample, but the thing they send turns out to be slightly different enough where it can create different results than what you expected. And that's one of the important reasons for having a type specimen repository and for labeling each specific piece you use so that if anyone says, I want to do research on this sample, you say, which piece? We have some samples that sample this part and some that sample this part. So you have to be very careful about that. So that's, that's sort of the first thing right there. Fantastic. Let me just skip ahead from here. But let me give another more common one. So everyone probably heard about the Bechar lunar meteorites, uh, Bechar 003, 006, 009. I think there's 010 and I think there's 011 or 12. There's, there's a lot of them. 
<laughs> and everyone's saying they're all the same thing. And while I do agree to some extent, they are mostly the same thing. This Betchar 009 that I classified is the only one so far that's been identified to have lunar fell sites, which are essentially granite, granites that you find on the moon, which are extremely rare. You find them in very few samples. And these other classes called lunar high iron class, which are related to the lunar fell sites. And it's important because these samples can tell us a lot about the late stage evolution of the moon. And yet none of the other Betchar pairings talk about this. So if someone had you know, said they were gonna do research on this and, they're, and someone said, well, all the Betchar samples are the same, someone might get a piece of Betchar 003 or 006 and expect to find these fell sites and they might not find them. Hmm. And that's why it's very important to, that even though yes, they are probably related on a large scale, they do have separate names because Betchar 009 has these fell site class which have not been identified in the other Betchar pairings. So that's one of the reasons I'm sort of for giving different numbers or different names, just because there are unusual features you might find in one that weren't reported in the metbull forms of the other ones, and those mm -hmm. deserve their own distinction. And because you're a splitter, you have it classified as a fragmental versus the other Betchars are feldpathic breccias. Exactly. Uh, for the feldpathic breccias, those are mostly classed of plagioclase rich and orthocyte material. But the fragmental breccias, whenever you get weird clasts like these fell sites and other clasts in there as well, I like to call it fragmental because they're, they're not all feldspathic. And it sort of misrepresents what the actual you know, classification of the rock is if you look at the clasts. Mm -hmm. So there's, there's different ways to put it. I do have a couple other cases, but if uh, we're, we're late on time, then I'm happy to end here. Yeah, why, why, don't, why don't you go over one more, man? Okay. I can always see you out. <laughs> okay, that's true. Uh, let me skip this one. Uh, let me skip that one. Okay, here's another one. So you guys, everyone's talking about Gadamus, and there's, I think there's, what is it? Zero, zero, one, two, three, four, something, something like that. And they're all sort of uh, called lunar anorthosite, and they're all sort of terms Ferroran and North Society, completely in material related to the Apollo 16 materials. Well, I, someone sent me, I'm not going to say who, but someone sent me a piece of something that they thought was paired to these Gadamus samples. And they asked me to do a pairing and say that this is 100% related to the Gadamus material. So here's what it looked like. And when I made the thin section, you know, I looked at it and I said, okay, there's a lot of Ferroran and North Society material. But then I found these clasts in here, you know, these clasts, this class, this class, this class this class, and I started getting their compositions. And when I plotted their plagic place, Veldspar, olivine Pearson compositions, they didn't plot in the Ferron and Orthocyte field. They plotted in the NG Suite field. So I felt that calling this a Gadamus pairing wasn't exactly true because it did have clasts in here that weren't Ferron and Orthocytes, which was sort of what the Gadamus material was. It was all termed Ferron mm -hmm. and Orthocytes. And so I was hesitant and I said, you know, I would call this a lunar feldspathic breccia. It's got mostly feldspar rich clasts, but it does have some, you know, different material that I would equate as being a mix of things rather than just being one material. So that's sort of an example where maybe there I'm a bit too extreme by doing my different clasts and saying that this should be something different. But again, it all comes down to the person you're sending the material to. And ultimately everyone sort of has their own lumper versus splitter view on things. So yeah. this might be a little different than what most people would have called this meteorite, but I like to be very careful with clasts because I specialize in looking at exotic class and lunar meteorites. So it also depends on the type of meteorite you send in. Yeah. So that's a good little plug because Daniel is always on the lookout for the next lunar with the coolest spinel or whatever in there. So if you're if you're in the meteorite community and you have some lunar and it looks a little bit weird and you want to make sure that someone doesn't lump it, but they go in there and look at all the class, do all the science, and then give you the what I think. I'm not I'm not saying anything against any other classifier, but I think is a very uh, professional and, and detailed classification with, with Daniel. So um, very good. And, and he's been a, a member of the Knowledge Bowlight crew for a while. So we definitely appreciate that. I'm, I'm looking for some weird stuff to send your way. But in the meantime, maybe I can send some questions from our crew. Is that all right? Of course. Yeah. Be awesome. more than happy to answer any questions. Uh, my only question was uh, uh, 
is there a lot of pairing going on now that they have that new CT class? So, so there has been work looking at stuff that was initially called CM chondrites. And there are many abstracts out on some of these scientific conferences that say that they've redone some of the way that they do oxygen isotopes and they've done more precise oxygen isotopic work and they've found you know slight deviations within that large cm chondrite field and through there they're able to say okay you know there are some that are cx cz ct you know all these different sort of branches so yeah there's a there's a lot of work now going back on previous classifications and starting to sort of split them rather than what was initially lumped as sort of one group. Um, the other question I had on uh, pairing was, I bought uh, in 2005, I bought some NWA2828, uh, which was later on uh, reclassified uh, in 2016 by Ruben. Uh, and he, he paired Paired it with Al Hagunia 001, NWA 002, NWA 1067, NWA 2636, and NWA 2965. And they were all started out as, or my 2828 started out as an Albright. And now it is an EL melt rock shine a little light on the EL melt rock part of this. So that, that's, a, that's a great point. Uh, I think there was a talk I gave, I think on one of, uh, I'm, forget, I'm forgetting the sample name, but that was also an Alhogonia 001 pairing. So the, the reason for that is, um, you know, in the, in the research field, there's all this ongoing work where we find out that we think, you know, these rocks are albrights, like for example, in those cases, but then they later did additional work and they found out that the grain sizes of some of those entities were sort of a little too small to be albrights. And then when you look into the different types of sulfides you find, they don't exactly quite match up with the albrights. And then you, you, know, you look into some of the textures, you know, and the fact that the rock sort of has some vesicles in some places. And then you begin to realize that that rock is actually more related to the eel, eel chondrites than it is to the albrights. And once somebody, you know, initially puts out that statement that, you know, these aren't albrights, these, we should actually do more research on them to find out what they are instead, then more people start doing research. And there's some other work, I think, um, I'm not sure if it's Arya Udri or someone else, but where they actually went into some of the, uh, uh, the albrights and they reclassified them as EL melt rocks or EL melt breaches as well. And so it's sort of just Initially, something is called something. Somebody later goes back, gets that sample to do research, and they find out that it's not exactly what they thought it was. And then that starts a new train of research on finding out what they actually are instead. Oh, that's cool that there's so much change in 10 years. It just shows the advances. That's awesome. Daniel, I have a question about uh, sample uh, homogeneity or heterogeneity and classification. Um, there, there's so many of the meteorites that have been studied much more carefully that we find that there are uh, multiple lithologies or uh, amongst the ordinary chondrites, we find you know, uh, breccias with different, um, uh, different amounts of metamorphosis. Are we handling that well in the Met Bowl, do you think? And do you have any guidance for how we would submit something that's not homogeneous? So that's a great question, Pat. So that, that's actually, so, so I'd say that to some extent, uh, it really depends on the, the piece of the sample you're looking at. So let's say if someone sent in 20 grams of this, you know, this uh, genomic ordinary chondrite, which just means, you know, you have type three material, type five material, type four mixed in. But let's say most of that material was type five, maybe 80% of it, 80 to 90%. And the piece that you took to make the thin section was just the type five material. Well, you would look at it and you'd say, this is type five. But then uh, maybe for example, you took a piece and it had you know, a type three class in it. Then the question is 90% of this is type five, 10% is this type three class. 
Do I call it a three through five? Do I call it a fives still because it's mostly five? And that sort of goes back to the idea of lumping versus splitting. And there was a recent sample that uh, my advisors classified, which initially was type five material, but they found a type three class in it. And they decided to go back and look at another piece from that same type specimen sent in and make a second thin section. And they found more type three material. So through more research, they were able to find out, okay, this isn't a type five, this is a three to five. And so to answer your question, it really comes down to the amount of work that somebody has to put into the, to put time into the sample to say, I'm gonna look at everything, scan the entire section. And if I find one thing that's different, you know, then I start doing more work into that versus scanning the whole thing and saying, okay, it's mostly five versus four or three. So it, it, it's sort of up to the preference of who's doing the work. Does that also speak to uh, how thoroughly we examine, uh, you know, we get one, one rock and you get one slice off one end, you get the trunk of the elephant, but the foot of the elephant's over here. Um, to me, I think that argues for exploring the sample, making sure you have a good understanding of it before you start the classification process. Absolutely. It, it, it pretty much all starts with the original sample that the collector sends in. If the collector notices that the sample is sort of heterogeneous, it doesn't really look the same, or, you know, it's like they see a lot of congruels and then they see this one object that looks like a class and they're wondering where do I cut it to send the piece, you know, for classification. My advice is always, if you can sample more lithologies or more weird things than one piece that you sent in, to do that. Because that gives the best opportunity for us to find any potential weird things in the sample that we might not have seen had we just got a regular, you know, rectangle with just chondrules. Thank you. We've had, we had a question in the comments and I'll, I'll address it first from a dealer uh, community perspective. And then Daniel, if you will as well, I appreciate it. The question is uh, because there's different levels of pairings and we're supposed to be able to trust and evaluate who, like who's there to protect us? Is there anyone policing this? Um, well, I'll tell you from the community, the media community viewpoint, it's pretty tight knit. If you're advertising something's paired to someone else's material, it's eventually gonna get it around to that dealer. They're gonna find out and they're either gonna have a discussion with you at that time. Um, so it's, it's it's like like Matt, like Mike said in his 101. It's the ethical thing to do is to approach the main mass holder and say, hey, look, here's what I'm trying to do. Here's what I'm attempting to do. Or here's what the scientists results say, and this is what we're going to do. Um, whatever. So I would say the, there's really no one policing it except the community of dealers ourselves. And you know, once you burn your reputation, you're burnt. Daniel. Those are some great points that you made, Topher. And uh, from 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 my perspective, uh, there there are different levels that I approach this. So, if someone sends me something and it looks similar to you know something unique that I classified, not like just an L six or an L five, like if like if it's specifically uh, material that either the main mass holder sent in to me, saying that you know I have some more material that I purchased and it looks pretty much the same. You know, in those cases, I'm okay with increasing the, the total mass, you know, because they acquired more material. In other cases, when someone says, you know, I think this thing is paired to this other lunar or paired to this, and I look at them and I say, okay, they are, they do look similar. I would feel more comfortable, you know, giving it its own number, but writing that likely paired with this material in the classification description. So that's sort of the second stage. And then the final stage, which is sort of the higher most point of knowing for sure that they're paired, especially with lunar meteorites, is if I took their bulk rock compositions and, you know, I, I, I studied them, each of the classes extensively, and I found, you know, the variances of the type of classes they have are very similar. The bulk compositions were almost identical, you know, stuff like that. Then I could say, okay, these things probably are truly, you know, paired together. But then that, of course, requires more money and more cost. So, the more, the more practical way is, for me is to assign a different number, but say that it's likely paired to this other one. Fantastic, really appreciate it. We're gonna look around the horn one more time for any other questions about pairing. I don't see him, so I'm gonna break my own rule. Daniel, can you talk to me about this? <laughs> um, Portales Valley, 
such a unique meteorite. It, it's classified as an H7, I think. If you look at it, it has metal veins. It, it is really unique uh, meteorite. And right now, people on YouTube are looking at a picture of it. Um, it I don't think, here's me being the, the scientist, I don't think it's just an H7 or an H6, whatever it's officially classified as. How is it, do we, do we ever go back? What is the process that maybe someone, when they gave the sample for, for Portales Valley, they gave a bad sample? They gave one lithology, like you're saying, and it's not representative. How do we go back and get that righted if it was wrong? So that's a great question, Topher. Uh, so there's a few different ways. So I'll give you uh, a couple examples. So the first thing is regarding the texture variations, you know, that one, you can have one piece of that meteorite and another piece and they can look completely different. It's sort of the same thing with Erichidia 004. Mm -hmm. that you have that you mentioned earlier you have the high metal and you have the low metal lithologies and if you just study the low metal lithologies you'd call it a winonite if you study the high metal lithologies some people might call it a you know a 1ab you know meteorite but it's really important that you you try to get all those lithologies when you're doing the classification now let's say you couldn't and someone already did it and you know they called it this well uh the the, the thing you'd need to do is you'd have to go back and find whatever material was called, you know, one thing, you know, or classified as that one thing. You can look at the type specimen that was used in the classification process. You can find out whether the person used one thin section, two thin sections, what piece of the type specimen they studied. You can, you know, just go to the person who holds the main mass, see if they have different pieces of that. It sort of involves you having to necessarily redo the classification again, but add additional information to it. So you sort of see on the Met Bowl, sometimes you have revised classifications where someone says one thing and then you have like another layer on the bottom that says revised or reclassified as a this. Mm -hmm. And the first is through, you know, doing just basic textural and mineralogical studies. But sometimes another way is through isotopes. So there was this one sample that was classified as an L3 and I was doing some research on it. And uh, Karen Ziegler at UNM did ice oxygen isotopes. And it turned out that actually it fit in the LL field. Mm -hmm. So I petitioned to have that sample reclassified as an LL3. So, you know, there, it's always okay to update things as long as you have enough evidence to validate that this should be something different. I appreciate that. I'm going to give everyone a call around the horn if you want to ask a non-pairing question. I'm going to ask another non-pairing question. Because and I think we're going to split this off into its own little video, Daniel, because it's, you know, when, yeah. when we have a classifier on, we just bubble forth with questions. Um, my, my question is, and this is something that I think I've asked you one time, we weren't recording, so we're recording now. Um, when you go into, I'm going to pull up an example of Abba Panu. Abba Panu is classified either as an L3 or an LL3 witness fall. Uh, you dig deeper into the scientist notes where he's measuring chondral sizes and, and that granular stuff. And there's a note in there that says, uh, based on blah, 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 possible L3.6, but it's not subtype. It's not officially classified as an L3.6 or whatever 3.6. It's just out there as a three, but the scientist notes say 3.6 as a dealer. What is my ethical obligation when I sell that? What do I put on the COA? Uh, that's a great question, Topher. Uh, I've been asked this question before, and you know, because sometimes I, I put like weird class lithologies in something, and it's really up to your preference. If the if on the metal you see that it's classified as LO3, but you know, in the classification section in the comments it says ordinary chondrite LO3 subtype estimated 3.6. Mm -hmm. As long as that information is listed on the page, it's all right for you to say that it's an LL3 estimated as LL3.6. But the key thing here is you want to be as transparent as you can with the details and make sure you don't word it in a way where you say it's a LL3.6, you know, and don't put any clarification that it was an LL3 estimated to be 3.6. So as long as you're transparent about that, it's, I think it's okay to list it as however you like. That's that's really good to know because uh, the, the, the Met Bull is the Bible. If it's there, I'm going to use it. 
um, but it's really good to call out, like you say, it's possible this, you know, um, just like when we call out paired, we're going to be calling out what type of pairing it is. Yes. And the key thing is possibly or likely, but not a hundred percent absolute yeah. this, unless you Daniel have Daniel told me. No. <laughs> um, <laughs> does anyone have any non-pairing questions for Daniel before we move on? All right. Hi, Daniel. Um, I have a question. A lot of times when I'm looking in the Met Bowl, I'll see classifications like an example would be, um, I think it's NWA 5000. That's like the legendary lunar or something like that. Um, and it's just classified as lunar. And I, I know that's like a really basic classification. And it was probably done 20 years ago or even more. Are there, does anybody plan to ever go back and and get more specific on some of those really basic classifications or is it just gonna like stay that way forever? It's it's tricky because, so the thing is that with, with some of those classifications, they have been you know worked up more in depth on research publications. So like maybe on the Met Bowl, it's called you know L3 or something like that, but, or like for example, just lunar. But then you see a research paper call, calling it lunar polymix breccia with distinct melt regions and three uh, shock events or something like that. And it's more specific. And it's sort of the fact that once it's classified, it can be used for research. But when people do research publications on it, in the scientific community, those publications sort of take precedence over the metal form, just because the research work itself is more in depth than the initial classification. So for some of those meteorites, there's really no need to go back from the scientific point of view because we've already published a lot of material on them that we don't really need to change the Met Bowl name because we already have a good idea of what it is. But there are some for sure that are sort of lacking and don't provide as well of an explanation as they should on the Met Bowl. But it, it, again, it depends on the, the sample. So they're probably more likely to go back and fix something that's incorrect. But if it's correct, it's not really detailed. They'll just leave it alone and, and rely more on the research and the papers that have been put out. Yeah. That, that makes sense. That's, okay. That's pretty much the thing, yeah. <laughs> All right. Thank you. They always say that uh, NWA 5000 is the most studied lunar in the world. Well, at one point it was. Maybe maybe Daniel's kicked that record. But it was the most studied lunar in the world. Then you go to the Meple and it says it's lunar, and that's all. Like, but it's good now that I now that I know that I could use a scientific paper. Obviously, it has to be a published, peer-reviewed, you know, something that's legit. But if they're calling out more information about it, that can also be called out as well, as long as you're not as long as you're putting a little proviso on there yeah and if you cite the paper itself that, oh. that's sort of the best thing you could do yeah fantastic good 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 advice our final question for daniel is someone he sees pretty much all the time can't get rid of him and now he's stalking him online vince what question do you have for daniel man thanks Topher. uh hey daniel so i want to follow up on sue's question regarding um you know sort of inaccurate or you know found to be inaccurate um information in the med bowl is there do you think there's sort of a um his, like a value to the the field maybe to uh posterity for keeping maybe inaccurate or outdated information on the med bowl that way scientists can maybe track the progression of a classification of a meteorite um you know i understand this concept of like uh, recording data and having data available, you know, uh, for, you know, new scientists to come in and, and, and review it. So, you know, what do you think of the whole idea of leaving um, a lot of original classifications in the Met Bowl that are maybe incorrect or later found to be erroneous, um, just to keep that data preserved, um, um, you know, for posterity? Great question, Vince. Uh, if you go into the Met Bowl and you look at some of the incorrect classifications, some of them actually do list the original incorrect classification. So like uh, this, this, this one that I was talking about where it was initially called an L3 and then reclassified as an LO3, it has the initial petrography and geochemistry from the initial classifier's description. And then right underneath it, it has a revised date and it has the newer updated petrography and geochem from the, the newer uh, classifier who, who did the correction work. So... I'm not sure if every single one has that, but from what I remember about the Met Bowl and what I was told about the Met Bowl, whatever was submitted can't exactly be completely removed uh, from the Met Bowl once it's already in there, unless it's like minor details. But if it's something where, 
you know, someone calls something a specific classification that has been used for many years, but was found to be incorrect, that description might still be there. And then you will see the updated one underneath it. So it does sort of provide that time integrated history, at least, which is helpful for that application of which you detailed. Thank you. And sometimes that's cool as a collector when you can get uh, a COA with the wrong classification on it uh, and science has been updated since. So that's another cool thing to, to look for in your collections. D Daniel, thank you so much for stopping by. As always, we appreciate all your information and the time you give us. And uh, mm -hmm. thanks for being a member of the crew. A conversation with Daniel Shake, a meteorite classifier and friend of the Knowledge Bolide. And it was about pairing. This meeting is being recorded.